Hey guys, this is Mr. Lowry. Um, this worksheet here, the Pythagorean Theorem, is a combination of uh, notes and also homework for uh, today's lesson. So in class today, we talked about the Pythagorean Theorem a little bit. You're probably familiar with some ideas about the Pythagorean Theorem, um, but we, there's also some things that we kind of want to talk about and deepen and ideas we want to strengthen. So um, I showed a, a video clip in class today. It's a mathematician named Vi Hart. She does these like doodling math class videos. And I, I've linked that here in your, your Canvas assignment. So if you haven't watched that, if you weren't in class, you should go back and give that a watch. It's only about eight minutes. But it's kind of funny, it's interesting, and um, it actually has some really important ideas that will kind of uh, be, come to bear on this, uh, this assignment here, okay? Um, and in that video, <clears throat> um, the two kind of important ideas that you'll pick up on is one that the Pythagorean theorem is a theorem not a formula okay a lot of times we say oh a squared plus b squared equals c squared right well that's not a theorem that looks like a formula the Pythagorean theorem is actually a theorem that's written as a conditional statement and the way Pythagoras originally wrote it there was never an a or a b or a c it wasn't an algebra thing. It wasn't a formula. It was an if-then statement, a conditional statement. And so that's one of the things we're going to talk about actually here in number nine, is the fact that it's actually a conditional statement. Um, and we're going to talk about how that relates to um, some of the problems down here as well. Okay. The other important idea that comes from that video is that Pythagoras had a hard time dealing with irrational numbers. In fact, he didn't really believe that there were such a thing as irrational numbers. And it caused so much controversy that um, this mathematician Hippasus, which was trying to kind of um, promote this idea of um, irrational numbers, was like thrown out of a boat and like drowned because um, you know, he believed in math, uh, in these other kinds of numbers, and, and Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans um, that didn't really mesh with their philosophy. So, the other thing we have to deal with is these irrational numbers. So, we got irrational numbers we have to kind of focus on and deal with. We need to talk about the Pythagorean theorem as a theorem, as a conditional statement, and what that means, and then we also need to apply it. Okay? Um, let's kind of Start. This is how I started in class as well. I kind of jumped around here a little bit. Um, I actually want to start with just you know talking about how you're used to using the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, the Pythagore Pythagorean theorem as you know it probably looks something like this. This is kind of what you're used to seeing. Okay, and we can use this. Uh, this is more of a formula here. It, it, we have to add some stuff to actually make it a theorem, but. Um, Oftentimes we use this formula to set up, you know, and solve a missing side of a triangle. So in this case, we go, you know, 3 squared plus 2 squared is equal to, c, um, well, x squared in this case. Um, and then we got, you know, a 9 and a 4 and an x squared. So 9 plus 4 is going to be 13 equals x squared. But if you notice, like, we're trying to find a missing side, and the missing side is x. It's not x squared. So Pythagorean theorem has a bunch of squareds in it, and we actually don't want squareds in our final answer. We, we want, you know, just regular x. So in order to undo this squared, the inverse operation that we need is the square root. Square root undoes square. They're inverses. They, they undo each other. So we've got to do it on both sides, keep the equation even. Okay, now typically when we do this, we put a plus minus here. But since we're trying to find a length, it, pro it won't be negative. We're not looking for you know, neg negative lengths don't necessarily make sense in this context. So we're just worried about the positive one. So root 13, uh, sorry, square root of 13 equals x. Okay, that's our answer. Now, if you want to know what square root of 13 is, it's somewhere in between 3 and 4, but it's a decimal, and it's an irrational number. So it's a, it's a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. Three point something, something, something. Right. And um, we don't want to estimate here. We don't want approximations. We want exact numbers. So um, this is going to be our, our final answer. Okay. Notice that it's a radical. A radical is a term for um, any expression that has like a, a square root in it. So this is a, called a radical. The other kind of a, a more generic term than that is irrational number. Um, irrational number is a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. Um, so not just square roots, but other things like pi and stuff like that 
fall into that family. So if we're going to be dealing with irrational numbers, we need to be able to know how to work with them. So what I have here up at the front is just some practice, like just some, some drill review basically for dealing with uh, irrational numbers and kind of how to simplify them. So let's take a look at a couple of these. We'll start with number two. Okay, now root 75 doesn't come out nice. Um, root 75 is somewhere in between 8 and 9, but it's a decimal, again, non-repeating, non-terminating. So um, we don't want to approximate it. We want to write an exact value. So what we're going to do here is what's called prime factorization. Okay, We're going to factor or break down this number into all of its multiplication pieces or all of its factors. Okay, So there's a couple different ways you can write that, but I want to see the prime factorization. Um, so I'm going to do it off uh, over here, uh, 75, and I'm going to make what's called a factor tree. Okay, so 75 is the product of 25 and 3. Now you don't have to use 25 and 3 because actually you could do 15 and 5, but you just keep going until you get all the prime factors, and 25 we know is 5 times 5. So 5 is prime, 5 is prime, 3 is prime, right? That's the prime factorization of 75. It's 5 times 5 times 3. So the square root of 75 can be written as the square root of 5 times 5 times 3. Okay? Now notice that there's that 5 times 5 is 5 squared. So actually, I can also write it like this, 5 squared times 3. Okay? The square and the square root are inverse operations, as we talked about a second ago. And so they undo each other. So these guys will like kind of cancel each other out, leaving me with just a regular old 5. But they're still, we're still taking the square root of 3, that's still there. So I get like a 5 on the outside and then like a square root of 3 that I can't do anything with. So when you write your prime factorization, you're going to go back and you're going to like, you know, find squares, find like powers of 2, basically, because powers of 2 get undone by the square root. Okay, so that is how you're simplifying uh, there, okay? Um, the next section just has some ideas with like multiplication and, um, and squaring and things like that. So similar kind of idea is gonna, is gonna happen here. Now root 14 is actually all the way simplified. It doesn't get any simpler than that because the factors of 14 are two and seven, which are both prime. And 42 um, is actually as simplified as it goes as well. This is uh, 7 times 3 times 2, or 7 times 6. And since there's no, you know, anything squared in there, this is as simple as it gets. But if I combine them, then I actually will be able to simplify. So we still want to do this prime factorization kind of idea. Um, 14 is 2 times 7, right? And then 42, you could say, is like 6 times 7, right? And 7 is prime. And then 6 is 3 times 2, and those are both prime. Okay, so all together, um, if we put all those together in the same root, we're going to have two sevens and, and two twos. When you're multiplying roots or radicals, if it's the same kind of radical, the same kind of root, then you can multiply the numbers inside. In this case, these are both square roots versus like a third root or fourth root. And so we can put all those numbers in the same square root. So this is 10 times the square root of 2 times 7, that's the 14, right? Times 3 times 2 times 7, that's the 42. Or if we wanted to rearrange it, right? I got the square root of 2 squared times 7 squared times 3. Okay, probably should have organized this a little bit better, but that's okay. Um, we'll kind of come over here now. So the square root and the square undoes, undoes, undo, undo each other, excuse me, the square root and the square undo each other. This 2 gets canceled out by this square root, which means that 2 is going to now be on the outside of the root. Okay. Now, since there's already a 10 there, we're going to have to multiply that 10 by 2 because the 10 is multiplying that root. And when the 2 comes out, it also is multiplying the root and the 10 and everything. Right? So we're going to have 10 times 2, and, uh, and that's you know gone now. And then same thing with the 7. The square root and the square undo each other. So a 7 comes out. Okay, the 3 isn't squared, it's just a regular 3, and so I can't do anything with that. It's just stuck inside. It's just a square root of 3. Um, but on the outside, I have 10 times 2 times 7, which altogether would be 140. Okay, 140 square root of 3. Okay, all done without a calculator, right? I don't 
you know, I, you can use a calculator. I'm sure you can get the right answer. I, I don't doubt your ability to do that. But what I want to make sure is you understand what the properties that you're using are, are doing. Okay, so we've got some properties of roots that we're using. I want you guys to do these by hand. Okay, over here we have something kind of similar. Um, this has a power though, so we need to deal with that. You're going to be doing some of this stuff when you get down here into the, the triangle uh, realm. Okay, so um, what I want you to notice here at number eight, sorry, it's got a little crowded over here, is that inside the parentheses, this is a product. It's two things getting multiplied. This is two times root 13, okay? So this is a power of products, and power of products is one of our properties of exponents. So in a power of products, every factor, every piece of the multiplication gets that power, right? So two squared, and then we have squared to 13, and that's also squared, okay? Now two squared is just four, that's fine. But these undo each other again, right? Inverse operations. Square root and square undo each other. And so we just get an, a normal 13. Cancel each other out. Okay, so that's uh, 52 altogether. Okay, no decimals on this guy. No decimals on this worksheet, okay? Give exact answers, simplified radicals on all of the problems, unless, of course, it comes out to a whole number, okay? Um, we don't want to deal with decimals because they're really just approximations. They're close to the right answer, but they're not actually the right answer. Okay. All right. Let's come down here really quick, and uh, let's talk about. So that that was one of the issues that we we talked about, and that kind of was brought up in that video, right? That the problem of irrational numbers, the problem of uh, working with Pythagorean theorem and realizing that you're going to get these kind of funky numbers that Pythagoras didn't know how to, to work with, but now we know how to work with them, okay? The other issue that the video brought up is that Pythagoras didn't do algebra, right? He was a, he was a geometer. They didn't have uh, algebra in ancient Greece at that time. Uh, algebra was kind of more invented in, like, uh, like, the, the east like uh, areas. So um, this idea here that this is the Pythagorean theorem is actually kind of incomplete. And let me explain like why that's the case. Okay, if I go over here and I look at number twelve, I have these these two numbers right, and I kind of set it up right. I'm like, okay, eleven squared plus fourteen squared equals x squared, and I want to solve it the same way. This is actually incorrect. This is not a true statement. What we're missing <laughs> is the fact that C needs to be the hypotenuse. So when you're taught the Pythagorean theorem, you're usually taught with a picture, and C is labeled as the hypotenuse, or this longest side, the side across from the, um, the right angle. So if you only think the Pythagorean theorem is A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you're missing the idea that really this is the leg of a, triang a right triangle, and this is the leg of a right triangle, and this is the hypotenuse. Okay? And in this case, we have a leg and a leg and a hypotenuse. So the correct way to set this one up would actually be something like this, 11 squared plus X squared equals 14 squared. And then you would want to go and solve it that way. That's the correct setup. In order to kind of highlight that idea and bring that to your attention, I wrote one of these problems to get you to kind of look at the book and think about conditional statements. So take a look at number nine really quick and read over that. And I'll show you in the book where you can find this stuff. Okay, so on page 350, there's the Pythagorean theorem. Now, again, back in the day when Pythagoras came up with this, he didn't have algebra. He wrote it as a conditional, right? So a conditional is an if-then. This isn't quite an if-then form, but I want you to put it in if-then form on your, in your uh, assignment here. So in a right triangle, the sum of the squares of the measures of the legs of the, of the legs, excuse me, equals the square of the measure of the hypotenuse, okay? This is the Pythagorean theorem. This is an algebraic representation that only works if we know the if part and if we have the triangle labeled this way, okay? Otherwise, it just kind of looks like a formula. So 
Um, to change this to like an if-then statement, it would probably look something like, if a triangle is a right triangle, then the sum of the squares of the measures of the legs equal the square of the measure of the hypotenuse. Okay, so I want you to go through that process of writing down that definition because, or that, excuse me, that theorem, because probably when you first learned this, you didn't even know what a theorem was. You probably just thought, you know, okay, like this is just another factor or something. But a theorem, remember, is like a conditional statement, an if-then, that you prove. And we actually went through the proof of the Pythagorean theorem in class as well. Um, so I will provide another video that, you know, has a, a proof of the Pythagorean theorem for you. I'll try to find a, a good one and link it in the, uh, in the, the assignment description. Uh, if, I, if I have time to do that, I'll, I'll do that for you. Um, so write this down uh, in, your, in your assignment. If a triangle is a right triangle, then the sum of the squares and the measure of the legs equal the square of the measure of the hypotenuse. Okay, that has much more information than just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. There's an if part, right? And the if part is if right triangle, then, right? Also, it has more information on what sides of the triangle we're talking about. So write that out here in number nine, okay? But add another kind of note to yourself, okay? a squared plus b squared equals c squared is fine as long as you know what a and b and c stand for and you have this right triangle lay memorized as well, okay? I think a more flexible way, maybe a better way to write it is more something like this. Leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. I'm gonna just abbreviate hypotenuse there, okay? Because now I know that the hypotenuse is supposed to go here, not necessarily the unknown, right? I go over here, 14 is gonna go there, okay? Let me kind of explain uh, also to you how to find the legs in the hypotenuse in kind of a, an easy way, okay? So start out with the right angle, okay? Find the right angle. Let's set up number 13, okay? Find the right angle and you're gonna draw an arrow through the right angle. That will point to the hypotenuse. So I'm gonna label this hype for hypotenuse, okay? So find the right angle and draw a line, that's the hypotenuse, okay? Then find the right angle and you'll notice the right angle forms an L. Like in this case, you see the L, the L, the L. In this case, it's a backwards L, but it's like still kind of an L. So here's the L, right? The right angle. The L stands for legs. So you could say like, okay, this is a leg and this is a leg. The two legs are the sides that form the right angle, that form the L, that create the L. All right, so hypotenuse, leg, leg. Now when you set up your, your uh, Pythagorean theorem, if you use this, you're always gonna get the right stuff in the right place. So nine squared plus x squared equals 16 squared, right? Now of course you need to go through and finish solving this and simplify your answer, but that's the setup. So label your hypotenuse and your legs so that I know you know what you're doing. And also on all of the problems that you do here, I wanna see the equation, okay? Um, I want to see your work. I want to see that you know how to set it up. A lot of people will do these in their calculator. They'll just go 16 squared in their calculator, and they'll subtract 9 in their calculator, and then they'll take the square root of that answer. Okay? I want you to do it by hand. I want to see the work. I want to see the organization. I want to know that you know how to set this up. Okay? It's not that much work. It doesn't take that long. <clears throat> Let's do it together really quick. 81 plus x squared equals... Uh, that's too big of a number for me to do in my head. So I'm going to use a calculator, but just to do the squared part. And I'm going to write down my numbers as I go. Okay? All right, so I'm just going to subtract 81 from both sides. <clears throat> that gives me x squared is equal to 175. Okay, I'm going to take the square to both sides. Sorry, 175. Okay, now this is going to be an irrational number. So we need to have a simplified radical, not a decimal, right? Um, let's prime factor the 175. That's 25 and 7. Is that right? Yeah, 25 and 7, um, which is 5 and 5 and 7. Okay, so there's my prime factorization. Sorry, cutting it off here. So this is the square root of 5 times 5 times 7, or 
the square root of 5 squared times 7. And since the square and the square root undo each other, that's going to be 5 root 7. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the back here. Now notice that some of these have, um, you know, radicals on them, and that's okay. We know how to deal with those. So the square root of 7 squared is 7. Okay, so actually, although these look kind of hard, um, they're actually not that hard. Uh, they're actually kind of easy. So let me show you what I mean. Okay, so again, right angle, cross. This is the hypotenuse. Okay, find the L. There's the L. That means this is a leg and this is a leg, right? The two sides of the L are the legs. Okay, so that means the square root of 7 squared, right? Leg squared, plus x squared equals the square root of 11 squared. Okay, and you're thinking like, oh, this is going to be so hard. This is actually super easy. Square root of 7 squared is just 7, right? The square and the square root undo each other. Plus x squared, right? 11, the square root of 11 squared is just 11, right? That's no big deal either. Okay, so subtract 7 from both sides. You get x squared equals 4. No big deal. Take the square root, take the square root. x equals 2. Okay, no calculator required. <clears throat> All right, notice on the back here we have the converse of the Pythagorean theorem as well. Let's take a look at that, and it's actually in your textbook as well. And this is on page 100, uh, 351, excuse me, 351. Okay, there it is, the bottom here. Okay, um, converse means you switch the if and the then, right? Um, the Pythagorean theorem, again, is a conditional statement. It's basically if right triangle, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared, as, or leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared, if it's a right triangle. So if right, then leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So the opposite of that, the, the converse of that, would be if leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared, then it's a right triangle, right? The problem is, is you can't call it leg and leg and hypotenuse if you don't know it's a right triangle. So let's look at the wording here. If the sum of the squares of the measures of two sides of a triangle equal the measure, sorry, the square of the measure of the longest side, then the triangle is right. Okay, well, the squares of the measures of two sides of a triangle, that would be leg and leg, equals the square of the measure of the longest side, that would be hypotenuse, then the, the triangle is right. But we don't know it's a right triangle yet. We haven't concluded it's a right triangle until the very end. So you can't assume, you know, you can't call it a hypotenuse in the, in the, the theorem because it's not a hypotenuse yet. You don't know it's a hypotenuse. But the idea is the same. Okay, so this is on page 351 in your textbook. Write this down. This is number 18, okay? And again, the whole idea is that we have these conditional statements. These theorems are conditional statements. They're not just formulas um, that you, you know, plug stuff into. It has an if part and an then part. Well, let's see how that works, okay? Let's take a look at, uh, at 19 here. Actually, I did 19 in class, um, so let's do, uh, let's do a different one. Um, maybe let's do 21, okay? So use the converse of the Pythagorean theorem to determine if each triangle is right. Now, when you look at this, it's kind of a little bit harder because you don't really know, um, you know, you don't have a right angle in there, right? So you got to kind of find the one that looks like the right angle, right? So this one looks like a right angle, okay? Also, it would, the, the longest side would be the hypotenuse if it was the hypotenuse. So when you look at these three sides, this one's the longest, right? So I don't know it's a hypotenuse. I don't know that this is a right angle, which is why it's not labeled that way. But if it is a right triangle, this would have to be the right angle. And this is the longest side across from that right angle. This would be the hypotenuse, which would make this guy a leg and this guy a leg, okay? If that's the case. Um, we don't know that that's the case yet, but we need to kind of label it anyway because we need to be able to set up the equation the right way. All right, so let's see how, how it's going to go. So leg squared, 4 squared, plus leg squared, that's 150, the square root of 155 squared, equals 13 squared. Okay, so we need to see if this statement is true. If this statement is true, then this is a right triangle, but it may not be true. 
So here's 16, right? Square root of 155 squared is 155 because the square and the square root undo each other. And then 13 squared is 169. This doesn't look like it's going to work out because I this looks like it's going to be 171. Let's double check. Yeah. So what I get is 171 equals 169, which is not true. This is called a contradiction, an untrue statement. Okay. So again, the, the converse of the Pythagorean says, theorem says, if this is the case, then the triangle must be right. But of course, it's not the case, so then the triangle is not going to be a right triangle. Or we can't conclude that it's right. So our final answer here is that it's not a right triangle. Okay. Again, in your homework, I want to see all of this. I want to see the equation. I don't just want yes or no. I want, you know, not right. I want to see the equation. I want to see the contradiction. Or it might give you something like, that is true. Like if this said 169 equals 169, I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, it is a right triangle then because it works. And this kind of statement here, a true statement, is called um, an identity statement. So some of these you'll get a contradiction, like this. This is called a contradiction. You'll say it's not, right? If you get an identity statement, a true statement, it actually works out, then you're going to say it is a right triangle. But again, I want to see that. Okay, last problem here, or the last one that I'm going to do with you. Okay, so you got two at the end here. I'll do one, and then you are going to be have to handle the other one. I'm just going to move this up uh, just a little bit here. Okay. So these are just two-step problems, and it's going to kind of test your skills with um, using irrational numbers and stuff because your answer is a simplified radical. So you're not going to grab decimal approximations. You're going to use the um, simplified radicals. Okay. Now, the final um, idea is to find y, but we actually can't find y until we find x first. So notice that there's a triangle here that's divided into two right triangles. On the left right triangle, I have missing side, missing side, 15. And so I don't have enough information. But on the right hand side triangle, I have side, side, and then I have a missing side. So this is the guy I can find. I'll find x first, and then I'll use that to find y. Start by finding the right angle and draw a line through it. Okay, that points to the hypotenuse. Okay, find the L. There's the L. So that means that this is a leg and this is a leg. Okay, now again, I, I don't like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I mean, I think it's fine, but it's not as, you know, informative if you don't understand that c is the hypotenuse. So instead, I do leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So in this case, I'll say x squared plus 10 squared equals 16 squared, and we need to find x, okay? So x squared, uh, sorry, plus 100 equals, that was 256. So x equals 156. Sorry, x squared equals 156. Um, and so then x is equal to the square root of 156. Okay. Um, that we're going to have to simplify. Okay. So that's actually, we know it's divisible by 2 because it's, um, it's even. Um, it's also divisible by 4. So if I break this up, this is 4 times 39. And this is 2 times 2. And 39 is 3 times uh, 13. And so these are all prime. Okay, so when I simplify all together, what I'm going to get is x equals 2 times root 39. Because there's not two threes or two thirteens, but there's two twos. So two root 39 there. So that's x. And now I have to do the Pythagorean theorem again on the other triangle. Okay. So again, this will be the right angle. Okay. Draw the arrow. Here's the hypotenuse of that triangle. Here's the L. It's a backwards L. That's okay. So leg and leg. But now I know that this leg, this L leg, is this. Okay. So let's set it up. So leg squared, y squared, plus leg squared. Now we could put x squared, but we actually know what x is now. So we're going to do this. 2 root 39 squared. Okay. Uh, equals 15 squared. Okay. 
All right, so y squared is there. Um, we don't know what that is. Okay, 15 squared. We'll use a, a calculator for that, and that's okay. It's okay to use a calculator. I just don't want you to rely on the calculator for the root stuff, okay? Like, I don't expect you to do 15 times 15 on your own, but you can, you know, you can simplify this without, you don't need to punch that into a calculator and get a decimal approximation. You can simplify it and use this. Okay, now over here, same kind of idea. We talked about this before, right? Two squared is four. Square root of 39 squared is 39. So, you know, if we want to do it off to the side, this is two squared root 39 squared, which is four times 39, okay? Again, you don't have to do that in your head, but we're not, you know, relying on our calculator for the root stuff. So this is actually comes out to 156, okay? Subtract 156 from both sides, and you get y squared equals 69, okay? Um, and then we're going to take the square root on both sides. Again, we're going to simplify if possible. But I don't, okay, so um, if you prime factor 69, it's 23 times 3, and both of those are prime, and you can't simplify it any further. Okay, so there we go, right? We did use a calculator, and that's okay, um, but we didn't rely on it for our roots. We simplified our roots, we didn't get decimal approximations. Um, we just kind of used the calculator for like plus, minus, multiply, divide, just to do the, the harder arithmetic stuff. Okay, so two-step process, that's kind of what you're going to do over here as well. Um, you're going to start by finding x, and then you got to go and find y. But make sure that your answers stay in simplified radicals. Okay, hope that's helpful, and I'll, uh, I'll see you guys in class soon. Thanks.